Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Alvis, and I am going to give a talk uh, entitled Vietnamese Language History in an Interdisciplinary Context. This was given as a keynote talk for the Fifth International Conference on Vietnamese and Taiwanese Studies at uh, Chenggong uh, University. So, uh, so the general topic and linguistic aspects. Um, I will be uh, giving a non-technical discussion of Vietnamese historical linguistics, and I will connect that research to ethno-historical and archaeological studies. Now, I say non-technical because my audience uh, for this conference includes people who are not linguists, um, but my audience knows Vietnamese and Chinese, whether it's Mandarin or Taiwanese or other types of Chinese. And I will use simple concepts such as tones, syllables, consonants, other common language terms. So the topics I will uh, discuss uh, include the Austroasiatic origins of Vietnamese. Sometimes people use the terms uh, Mon Khmer, but in fact, the best term is Austroasiatic for the entire language family. That's the, the clearest way to talk about it. Uh, second, the nature and degree of language contact with and linguistic influence from uh, Chinese. Uh, and third, the historical development of Vietnamese tones. Uh, and fourth, changes from a bisyllabic typology to a monosyllabic typology. And that's not too complicated, but you know, I'll explain the kinds of any specialized terms I'll, I'll explain when I'm talking about them. And then I will relate all of these to ethnohistory. And so something that, as, as I said, it's interdisciplinary. Okay. So uh, let me start with my key observations that I'll be looking for uh, when I'm talking. Uh, first, the modern linguistic typology of Vietnamese, and that means the structure as well as the vocabulary, uh, which is Chinese-like, took many, many centuries to evolve. I will show this. It did not happen suddenly. It was a long process. And so we look at it and say, oh, it looks Chinese-like, but in fact, it's a lot more complicated. Now, I'll show you that kind of evidence. Second, Vietnamese preserves many original non-Chinese uh, Austroasiatic linguistic features and Austroasiatic words, <clears throat> despite numerous Chinese loan words and influence on Vietnamese linguistic structure. So the <clears throat> native elements are still in Vietnamese, and we have to know how to look for those. And that tells us information about that's no history as well. Third, this scenario can offer insights into the socio-cultural status of the ancestral language of Vietnamese through the first millennium in Chinese-occupied Northern Vietnam. <clears throat> now, again, I'm talking about socio-cultural uh, uh, cultural status, but looking at the language issues. And I'm not talking about modern Vietnamese. I'm talking about Vietnamese you know, 2000 years ago or anywhere in the past. And it wasn't Vietnamese at that time, as I'll explain. Okay. So uh, before I do that, I want to briefly mention my research background because obviously I'm not Vietnamese. And so, you know, why am I talking about this? So uh, I've published, uh, I have many linguistics publications, uh, some 50 publications in a book and edited volumes. <clears throat> and I'm the editor of the journal of the Southeast Asian Linguistic Society. And my publications uh, focus a lot on Vietnamese linguistics, uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, there are a variety of topics which include uh, broader Southeast Asian issues, Austroasiatic issues, <clears throat> and beyond linguistics, things which are, again, some related to archeology, span related to uh, ethno history. Uh, and this is what I want to encourage uh, other people to do as well to, for better methodology. Oh, and you can see my uh, presentations and, and uh, publications at those websites on academia.edu and researchgate.net. So um, now let's start with research uh, of the origins of Vietnamese and Vietnamese language history. And this research goes back over 150 years. So in the late 1800s to the early 1900s, the, um, there was an early, there were early hypotheses of, of some kind of Austroasiatic origins, uh, 
that these were based on limited evidence, just some comparative word lists, meaning lists of Vietnamese and some other languages. It, it was interesting. Some of it's interesting, but very limited data, and the methods were not um, so consistent. <clears throat> And uh, there was some disagreement in, in the early 1900s, in 1912 specifically, a French scholar, Maspero, published an in-depth study of Vietnamese in comparison with Mung, Austroasiatic, Dai, Chinese, and he suggested uh, uh, Dai origins, Dai meaning Thai, Lao, Zhuang, other languages like that. <clears throat> but a few, a few decades later, uh, later in the century, Audricourt uh, supported the Austroasiatic uh, origins through a hypothesis of origins for Vietnamese tones. And he also noted shared early Chinese loanwords in both Vietnamese and Dai languages. So there's some confusion. We see these words that look similar in Vietnamese and Dai. Well, some of these are actually from uh, Chinese. So he's helped to sort out the confusion. And in the second half uh, of the 20th century, uh, oops, let's move that up there. Uh, there was growing support for Audricourt's hypothesis uh, from various scholars inside Vietnam and, and uh, internationally. Uh, and then uh, we can move to the 21st century here, and we have some new directions. And Fan's uh, hypothesis, not quite a decade ago, about a decade ago now, of Annamese Chinese, and Annamese meaning Annan, that region, the old name of, of uh, Vietnam. <clears throat> and the idea was of a local Chinese speaking community in Northern Vietnam, okay. And there is also growing data sources uh, and uh, we have more methods of historical linguistic research with an interdisciplinary approach. So all of those together give us uh, this basic uh, insight or observation and what the language, what the research shows us. Vietnamese is an Austroasiatic language with a Chinese style linguistic template and significant lexical borrowing from Chinese. This situation developed through Sinitic Vietic bilingualism. I'll explain that in a, in a couple of minutes. I'm not saying Sino-Vietnamese yet and a literary tradition. So both bilingualism, people speaking the languages and this literary Chinese literary tradition. But also the situation is due to native Austroasiatic elements that have been retained and um, as well as Southeast Asian regional linguistic trends and not just Chinese and Vietnamese and so other languages participated in this. So, okay. So uh, uh, let's start with those four topics. The first one uh, being the Austroasiatic origins of uh, Vietnamese. And uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, images of a map of Austroasiatic. You can see those colors there in, in mainland Southeast Asia, down to, uh, down to the Malay Peninsula, up to Eastern India. And we see evidence of these uh, archeological evidence of sites such as the Phum Nguyen culture and Dam Sun culture and uh, Angkor Wat. And those are all <clears throat> historical evidence of, of Austroasiatic uh, ethnohistory broadly. So uh, what can we say uh, about the Austroasiatic origins of Vietnamese? Well, uh, the Austroasiatic language family has 13 branches. Branches means groups of related languages within the family. It, some 160 languages in mainland Southeast Asia, Southern China, Eastern India. And these languages are mostly bisyllabic and non-tonal. And as I'll talk about later, it's different from the Chinese template and Vietnamese template of being more monosyllabic and having complex tone systems, okay? I'll come back to this idea. The linguistic evidence to connect this has been repeatedly supported by decades of data and research of shared basic vocabulary, such as numerals, body parts, natural phenomena. I'll show you some examples. Recurring phonological correspondences. That's a big phrase that basically means patterns of speech sounds, not all the same, but there's some kind of patterns in what the differences and similarities are. And there are other Austroasiatic like linguistic features. I'll, I'll sometimes type AA for Austroasiatic. Austroasiatic like linguistic features such as reduplicative words, Vietnamese thu lai, 
um, word order and noun phrases and Vietnamese adjectives go after nouns. That's the opposite of Chinese in which uh, adjectives go before nouns. And there are some other features as well. Another crucial feature, uh, could, um, way we can show this uh, is the Vietic connection. So Vietnamese is in the Vietic branch of Austroasiatic, one of those 13 branches, right? Vietic. Other languages, Vietic languages, such as Arem or Rup, have uh, archaic features, features that are, you know, more original features. Uh, they are bisyllabic. Uh, they are less tonal. Some of them have no tones. This is like other Austroasiatic languages, such as Khmer, Mon, Katu, and Bahna, those uh, uh, very Austroasiatic like features. So, how can we see this connection between Austroasiatic and modern Vietnamese? Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is how we go from a more complex word shape to a simpler word shape and from non tonal to tonal. Okay, so let's consider the words nose, husked rice, and middle. In modern Vietnamese, those words are mui, gao, and chum. And uh, for the Proto Austroasiatic reconstruction, and uh, uh, by the way, I mark this with uh, the standard ways to put these little asterisks, means that these are not modern forms. These are reconstructions. We think that the sounds were approximately like this by comparing many, many languages. And so you can see here, uh, it, they look a little like Vietnamese, but there's some things like this final S here. Over here, you see this thing that looks like a question mark with no dot, that's called a glottal stop. So just, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And I'll, I'll come back to that specific symbol later. And then gloom for middle. And uh, we can also look at that Vietic branch and Proto-Vietic here. Oh, well, that looks fairly similar. We still see a reconstruction with that S. And these are not my reconstructions. These are the reconstructions of other scholars. This is from Shorto. This is uh, Ferluse. Uh, also, we see that glottal stop again, OK? Uh, looks a little different. This vowel is different, but it looks like the same word shape. But we can see this word shape in modern Arem, which is a related Vietic language. And so instead of mus with an S sound, mu with an H sound, which is, that's a very common change. This S to H is common among the uh, uh, Austroasiatic languages. And we see again that glottal stop sound. So something like nko and then tlong. For, uh, uh, for middle, okay? And we can see we're kind of moving in the direction of Vietnamese. Proto-Viet Mung, meaning the language of Vietnamese and the various Mung dialects. It's not really one clear language. It's a much more complicated situation. We say Mung as though it's one language. It's more complicated than that. Anyways, instead of seeing S or H, I have this B here, instead of glottal stop, we have a C here. Uh, the A, B, and C are actually tone categories, and I'm going to come back to that. So we're looking at, we don't have these sounds, but we have tone categories instead, okay? That's an important pattern, and I'll come back to that. And we can see modern Mung here, and it looks similar to Vietnamese, not 100% the same. Again, we can see a kind of transition from these. And just because I have the uh, information, uh, Alexander, these are from Alexander de Rhodes Dictionary in 1651. Okay, so we're starting to look uh, more modern at that point. Okay, good. When we see these kinds of phonological correspondences, and we can see this very clear transition. Uh, we know that this Austroasiatic origins that go back 4,000 years, they become clear. And this is strong systematic evidence. And there are many words that support this. Such data includes Austroasiatic words in Vietnamese from various semantic and cultural domains. So uh, as I mentioned, that kind of basic vocabulary such as body parts, mat, tai, natural phenomena, uh, va, mai, bai, are all uh, solid Austroasiatic uh, etima, etima meaning, you know, words that uh, are connected in that proto language. Uh, numerals, mot and ban bon, uh, units of time, ngai, nam, and these location words. And kinship terms, 
and early culture words such as the domesticated dog and weaving and rice production, a winnowing basket, bran, pestle there, nam, kam, jai. So this is very important kind of vocabulary that connects Vietnamese to Austroasiatic. Uh, there are many of such words, and I've previously published uh, about 200 such Austroasiatic words in Vietnamese, and this is, this is very strong uh, evidence of the Austroasiatic words in Vietnamese, as well as information about the original culture. And uh, these are, are uh, such words have very low cross-linguistic rates of borrowing. What I mean is, when we look at other languages around the world, these are the kinds of words that are tend not to be borrowed. They can be borrowed, all words can be borrowed, but these kinds of words have a much lower rate of borrowing among languages. There's studies for this. So these kinds of words are widely used by historical linguists in any, for any language as a key criterion for establishing language affiliation. Okay, so what are the ethno-historical implications of this Austroasiatic linguistic data. <clears throat> well, let's talk about the Neolithic expansion and Austroasiatic. Uh, there is archaeological and linguistic data that supports a uh, connection between Austroasiatic speakers and Neolithic agriculturalists that spread into northern Vietnam and mainland Southeast Asia about 2000 BCE. Okay, so this has been looked at in the archaeological in ar uh, archaeological field, okay? Uh, from Austroasiatic to Vietnamese. So these Austroasiatic speaking groups, they're connected to Vietic. So we then connect these early Austroasiatic groups who are to modern day Vietnamese speakers. And it's the language, of course, that we're connecting, not necessarily the ethnic group, but uh, it is the case that the, the, uh, there is some kind of connection. Uh, Vietic and the Bronze Age. Uh, my own working hypothesis in, in uh, considering, you know, when did Vietic become separate branch of Austroasiatic? And this is impossible to say with spe specificity, but I think that the start of the Bronze Age, which is usually connected, commonly connected uh, by Vietnamese archeologists with the uh, Dam Do culture, Ban Hoa Dam Do. Um, and the Metal Age is associated with sociocultural developments and therefore possible linguistic developments. A Vietic in the Han Dynasty. Evidence suggests that Vietic was spoken in Northern Vietnam in the Han expansion. And uh, uh, there've been increasing studies showing this. This has been debated. Uh, I think the evidence is pretty good. And this scenario is supported by numerous early Chinese loanwords. Uh, and then from Vietic to Viet Mu, that later stage, Sinitic Vietic sociocultural and language contact was a likely factor in the differentiation between A, Austroasiatic like Vietic languages, such as Arem, which I sh showed you before, more Austroasiatic like, and the Sinitic like Vietic uh, languages that became Viet Mung and eventually Vietnamese. And so um, that's, that's what we can get out of this. So, um, Vietnamese is an Austroasiatic language, but Vietnamese is also known for long-term contact with Chinese and uh, language and Chinese culture. But I'm not going to say Sino-Vietnamese language contact for that early period, not in the first millennium, okay? Instead, I will use the term Sinitic Vietic, especially at the Han Dynasty, the earliest contact. In the Han Dynasty 2000 years ago, the, Austro, uh, the ancestral languages of modern Chinese and Vietnamese, they were very different, as we saw uh, in that slide of, of Proto-Austroasiatic and Chinese. Also, the reconstructions are very different uh, for that early period. There was no Vietnamese in terms of ethnicity or linguistic structure at that point. Okay, So it was a different animal at that time, basically, a different uh, creature. Okay, uh, but when we talk about the second millennium, the second millennium, then there is evidence of Vietnamese as an ethno-linguistic identity and in its linguistic structure. And we can then genuinely uh, talk about Sino-Vietnamese through Han Viet, uh, Han Yuet Su. And so um, uh, uh, the timing of this is widely considered by various 
scholars, researchers in linguistics to be uh, connected to the late Middle Chinese period at the turn of the second millennium. And if you don't know Middle Chinese and that you don't doesn't matter too much about a thousand years ago, again, we cannot be specific. Uh, these are approximate periods, okay. Uh, but it is important to separate readings of Chinese characters and actual loan words. A loan word means you're borrowing it and you're using it when you're speaking and certainly writing potentially, but there are also thousands of Chinese pronunciations. Of, of, there are thousands of Vietnamese pronunciations of Chinese characters, but many were not borrowed for speaking. Let's see that word there, dan, like dan shi, but, uh, and uh, there's this pronunciation for it, dan, like that, but you check it in a dictionary for Chinese character readings, it's not in a regular dictionary because it's not used for, for speaking. Okay, so we just we're focusing on those ones which were actually borrowed. And we can consider single syllable Sino Vietnamese loan words, such as uh, hiu, gao, dian, ji, ka, uh, from those Chinese forms, xiao, gao, qian, zhi, ge. So uh, those are the, the Chinese character readings, but they are used in speech by Vietnamese speakers, right? That's part of the spoken language, regular regular and written language as well. Uh, the two syllable Sino-Vietnamese compounds, they're SV by the way, SV for Sino-Vietnamese, they're more modern era, okay? Something like Dien Thoai. Obviously there were no ancient telephones, right? That's a modern era kind of uh, word. And there were many of these two syllable uh, kind of compounds that were created uh, in, uh, by, by Chinese speakers as well as Japanese speakers. And then they spread to Vietnamese, Korean, it spread throughout East Asia broadly. So a lot of these words are, uh, some of them were ancient, but some of them are, are more modern. And so, you know, that's not borrowing from Chinese in the same way, right? It's a, it's a different kind of borrowing. Okay, so what about the language situation for this? So uh, such character pronunciations, right? We're talking a thousand years ago, uh, are linked to a hypothesized enemies Chinese. Again, I, I explained that, right? So a local dialect in Northern Vietnam from the first millennium. So by the time we get to the second millennium, that group is there. And this group is what we're, we're looking at with these pronunciations up here, okay? So that, that's what we're, that's the idea. But what about the thousand years before Sino-Vietnamese vocabulary. We should expect Chinese loanwords before 1000 CE, right? And uh, well, there are. Uh, it has taken decades to identify them, but at this point we've identified uh, some several hundred early Chinese loanwords from before this, before this Sino-Vietnamese late middle Chinese uh, period. And they have distinct phonological features that show us that these words were borrowed earlier. Okay, they're basically borrowed two times. They're borrowed for that reading, those Chinese character readings, but before, okay? Um, and they include many cultural domains here. Take a look at this. And these are from a couple of my recent publications. And you can see here, uh, household structures, household items, clothing and decorations, food and cuisine, and grammatical vocabulary. That's just from these publications. There, there are quite a few more. And this is all from that early Chinese loanword period, anywhere from the Han Dynasty through the Tang, basically. And so I'm not going to be specific. We don't have uh, so many details, OK? Um, and again, we can identify these through regular phonological correspondences, the sound patterns, and from ethno-historical information. When we see these things, we can check historical records a little bit for this, okay? And this is based on large amounts of carefully checked data and methodology. It's careful because I exclude many, many hundreds. I've excluded hundreds of possibilities. We'll say, do these look similar? No, they're no good for these reasons, okay? We have to be uh, careful about this, ready to exclude possibilities, then what we do have is, is stronger evidence. Uh, what are the ethno-historical implications of this Chinese loanword data? Okay, so early Sinitic Vietic content. Chinese historical texts and early Chinese loanwords both suggest a bilingual Sinitic Vietic community in Northern Vietnam from the time of East uh, Han Dynasty and onward. 
Okay. Uh, early Sinitic cultural influence. We can see sociocultural impact of Chinese communities in Northern Vietnam in the first millennium through these cultural domains of early Chinese loanwords, including things such as silk production, metallurgy and metal implements, abstract cultural concepts. Uh, I'll show you some more examples so you'll get to see them. Uh, enemies Chinese. Texts do not directly uh, uh, mention a large Chinese speaking population in Northern Vietnam through the entire first millennium, but that population is indicated by early Chinese loanwords and by later Sino-Vietnamese vocabulary. But we still have retention of native linguistic elements. Vietnamese culture and language provide evidence of Chinese influence, but Vietnamese core native vocabulary and other linguistic elements are connected to the original Austroasiatic source. But question, what influence did this situation have of this borrowing and contact have on the changes from Austroasiatic to Viet Mung and then to, to modern Vietnamese? Okay, so now we're thinking, you know, we have these two points. Uh, how did we get from point A to point B? The first thing uh, I will talk about is, is tones, okay? And we see tones in all uh, varieties of Chinese and in Vietnamese, as well as other languages in the region. And they all have lexically distinctive pitch and contour. But uh, uh, when I say lexically distinctive, I mean, you know, they change the meaning of a word, right? And one word and another word are differentiated by tones. Pitch, high, medium, low, contour, going up, going down, staying level. Uh, but Vietnamese tones are sometimes accompanied by glottalization and breathiness, that word glottalization. We saw that glottal stop before. Let's see what this looks like. So here in, in Mandarin, we have our usual uh, paradigm here, ma, 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 fine. Uh, we have Cantonese, with, which has some more tones, uh, C, 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 C. And people say it has nine tones, which it does historically, but for, our, for speaking purposes, there's, there's six basic tones. And then in Vietnamese, we also have six tones and uh, ma, 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 ma. And uh, notice specifically ma and ma having that kind of what we call glottalization. And some of the other tones have a little bit of that as well. And so that's important because that's connected to those uh, glottalized features that I talked about before, okay? So now the Sino-Vietnamese tone categories that's somewhat different from the native ones. Now, every, if, let me back this up. Uh, every uh, syllable in, China, in Vietnamese has tones and, as they do in Chinese. For Vietnamese, this includes both words that are native words, not Chinese, and the Chinese words. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. There are many, many thousands of words in Vietnamese which are not from Chinese, but they still have tones. Okay, uh, but the words that are Sino-Vietnamese tones are exceptionally good at matching the traditional Chinese tone categories from the Chie Yun, Thiet uh, Văn, which is a Chinese rhyme dictionary published in about 601 CE. And uh, maybe some of you have seen this before. And so Ping Shang Chu Ru are those four tone categories, A, B, C, D. In Vietnamese, Bing, Thung, Khu, Yap. And so um, Vietnamese, the sign of Vietnamese, part of the vocabulary, those tones match exceptionally well, as, as good as any Chinese dialect, okay? This is why we, that's, that's important to understand. So Chinese clearly influenced the Vietnamese tonal system, but how did tones emerge in these languages and what were the ancestral languages like? What were they like? Okay, so to think about this, it's important to understand that complex tone systems are rare. In one global study, only 17% of, uh, of some 500 languages uh, have complex tone systems, very small, less than one in five. Uh, and 58% uh, of them have no tone systems and the others have simple tone systems. Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, the languages in the region have complex tone systems. As for Austroasiatic, only a small percentage of Austroasiatic's uh, 160 plus languages have tone systems. 
indicating that Proto-Austriasiatic was non-tonal. So Vietnamese comes from Austroasiatic, originally non-tonal language. Okay, so how did we get there? How do we get to where we are today? And so we can look at Odrigore's hypothesis of the origins of tones in Vietnamese. Odrigore's hypothesis in a couple of papers in 1953 and 1954 impacted understanding of tonogenesis in languages in the region due to Vietnamese and its non-tonal affiliation. He identified consonants, you know, bataka, mananga, a consonants in Austroasiatic that match certain tones in Vietnamese. So let's take a look at some samples. Uh, here is a word, rui, uh, fly, a fly. And it's related to this word, which is in pro reconstructed in proto austroasiatic something like this. And we say, oh, well, that does look familiar. It looks similar, indeed. Um, now, this is our, think of this as the level tone, the ping sheng, okay? And then the sak and nan tones. Uh, here's an example with ga for fish. And in proto austroasiatic ga, something like that. And we see that glottal stop that we've, I keep mentioning. Okay, so, oh, okay, something about that glottal stop there. Uh, for the third category, C, ho and nga, uh, we see this word mui, and it's mush. What's interesting, that looks a little bit like the word for nose. We saw that before. It had a similar pattern with that S at the end, or ba, throw away from uh, Proto-Austroasiatic ba. And again, we see both S and H at the ends of these words here. By the way, this would be Ping, Shang, Chu, and then of course, Ru. This is the Ru Sheng, uh, uh, Sak and Nang again, but in words that have Ba or Ta or Ka at the ends of them, okay? I know this is a little technical, but this is what we have to do to, to understand these things, okay? So again, uh, B has this final glottal stop, uh, C has a S or H, all right, good. So result, Vietnamese offered a model for tonogenesis due to its affiliation with non-tonal Austroasiatic languages. And this allowed Ordrecourt to hypothesize that ancestors of modern Chinese, Dayak, Hmong Mian, and Vietnamese were all non-tonal in the Han dynasty. This is something you may not be familiar with, the idea of Chinese or Vietnamese or Dai, also Hmong Mian, as being non-tonal 2,000 years ago. This idea is widely accepted. Not everyone agrees, but most do. Most historical linguists in the region at this point that, and I showed you before, complex tonal systems are not common among human languages. Okay, now what can we do with these tones in looking at early Chinese loan words versus the later Sino-Vietnamese vocabulary? Okay, so we can compare these specifically in the shang, shang and chu, shang tone categories, that B and C tone categories. Okay, this gets a again a little technical, but if you know Vietnamese and Chinese, you'll you'll pick up on this. Okay, so let's take a look first at let's say chopsticks and hat, and you'll see dua and mu, and you see both have the uh, ngã tone, but in the Sino-Vietnamese reading. For these chu and mao, we have zha and mao. These are what you find in a dictionary of Chinese character readings. These are not listed as being Chinese, but they are. They're early Chinese loan words, not Chinese character readings. But look at the first two, net and silk, mang and lua, versus the sign of Vietnamese readings, vau and lu. So instead of having, uh, here we had uh, nga, and then we have na. But here we have not, and we have nga, and the, I'm not going to explain exactly how this works, but I will simply say to look at the Chinese, old Chinese reconstructions, that means 2,000 or more years, and we see final glottal stop, and we see final H, just like we did for some of those Austroasiatic words. This is what, what Audrey Kaur pointed out, but then we can go a step further, um, uh, Mei Zulin, uh, a Chinese linguist, pointed highlighted this issue. And uh, now we can use this kind of pattern to identify the early Chinese loan words and say, these were from the first, these were borrowed in the first millennium, okay? Anywhere from the Han to the Tang. And, and I, I have hypotheses about the timing, but you know, who knows, it, it's complicated. But you can also see these are more cultural types of words, you know, okay. All right, so what are the ethno-historical uh, implications? Um, first, 
uh, these were originally non-tonal languages. Both Sinitic and Vietic were non-tonal at first contact. Ooh, now that's something. Okay. Uh, chronology. The several hundred early loan words, uh, Chinese loan words, represent early spread of Chinese cultural practices in northern Vietnam, such as the use of chopsticks or paper. And these can all be checked in uh, archaeohistorical, uh, well, historical texts, and sometimes depending on the object in historical archaeological records. Ethno-historical and archaeological implications, we can distinguish periods of early Chinese loanwords, potentially, and thus the timing of cultural impact. But more archaeohistorical and historical phonological study is needed. And last, that uh, local Chinese community, the consistency of the tones of the early second millennium Sino-Vietnamese words supports the hypothesis of a local Chinese community in northern Vietnam. This is, would be like having Yue Yu in, in Guangdong and uh, Min Mi Yu up, up a little bit farther, you know, in Fujian area, that's something like that. Another type of Chinese, no longer there, but uh, the evidence is there. Okay, so uh, the fourth category I'll do is, is uh, look at is uh, Vietnamese monosyllabicity and previous bisyllabicity. Okay, basically having one syllable or two syllables. Again, a little technical. I don't think it's too technical. Okay, what is a monosyllabic language? Maybe you've heard that term before, the Chinese or Vietnamese being monosyllabic. It means a one-to-one -one correspondence between syllables, which are the pulses of sound, syllable, and morphemes, which are the sounds plus the meanings. Okay, um, so just so that you understand, if I say honey, that's one word, but it has two syllables, honey. But it's one morpheme. We can't divide that word anymore. It's just one meaning, one word, but it has two syllables. Cats, well, that's one word. It has one syllable, cats, but it actually has two morphemes. Cat is one morpheme that has meaning, and S has another meaning, so it's plural, okay? I hope, hope that's not too bad, right? That shouldn't be too bad. And then Austroasiatic language, they can be bisyllabic and they uh, like English. So you can have the meh, meaning new, that's one word, one morpheme, you can't divide the word, but it is two syllables, the meh, okay? Uh, versus a word like bahok, bahok means to teach one word, two syllables, bahok, and two morphemes, hok is actually from Vietnamese, hop, the sign of Vietnamese word, of course. Ba means to cause, cause to learn, to cause to study to teach. In Vietnamese, mut, one syllable, one word, one morpheme, gak con meo. That's plural, classifier, and cat for three words, three syllables, three morphs. That is a one-to-one -one correspondence, okay? So Vietnamese is a robustly monosyllabic language, but it belongs to a language family that has a, a bisyllabic, polysyllabic word structure how and why did this happen and when did this happen? So uh, how much did, did Chinese impact Vietnamese word structure? Now, I'm gonna mention one other detail. Uh, modern Vietnamese is monosyllabic and it lacks these uh, Austroasiatic presyllables. It also lacks Austroasiatic consonant clusters. I'm sorry to introduce a new topic, but consonant clusters are two consonants together. And often they'll have something like L or R at the beginnings of words. In Austroasiatic, you have a word like blo or pra, and you see PL and PO. Those are the consonant clusters. We don't have that in Chinese and we don't have that in Vietnamese. They do not, there are no words in Chinese or Vietnamese that have this L or R in that position, like we do in English, right? Um, play and a pry, something like that, okay? Um, now, we know that Vietnamese has borrowed a lot of Chinese words, and the recent careful studies in Vietnam by Vietnamese researchers show that the Vietnamese lexicon is at, at most, at most 40% Chinese, that is 60% or more non-Chinese. A majority of the Vietnamese vocabulary is not Chinese. Those 70% numbers, they were never... Um, that was not based on research. Those numbers, uh, I don't know where those numbers ever came from, but 
these are real numbers based on real research, okay? Uh, question, most vo Vietnamese vocabulary is native. So how much did this language contact with Chinese affect Vietnamese word structures? We borrow the words, but, and Vietnamese looks kind of like Chinese. How did this affect things? Okay, this is my last uh, issue. And uh, there is textual data. This is rather significant. And I think not many people know this yet. There's textual data in gnome texts from the early second millennium that shows some of these Austroasiatic like bisyllabic words. Okay. These were all completely lost by the, the 1651 dictionary of de Rhodes, but there were bisyllabic words in Vietnamese maybe a thousand years ago still. Okay, we don't have the, the timing of this perfect, but uh, that is very strongly the case. Okay, these consonant clusters, they remained into the early 1800s. And these uh, things like mla or bla or tla, you can find those easily in the De Rhodes Dictionary, but even into the early 1800s. This is nearly 2000 years after the recorded presence of Chinese in Northern Vietnam. That, that took a long time, okay? So observation, the process of developing Chinese-like syllable structure took nearly 2000 years, not immediate. This phenomenon has been happening in languages in the region, not just Vietnamese. The modern Vietnamese syllable structure is kind of misleading. It makes us think something was instant because it's so extreme, it took a very long time. And my conclusion from this, I think, is that the, uh, this is my opinion, uh, that the data shows Viet the Vietic ancestral language of Vietnamese had significant sociocultural status to keep the original native linguistic structure for several centuries and more in parts during Chinese administration control. It did not suddenly become like a Chinese dialect. Okay, what are the final ethnohistorical uh, linguistic observations I can make. Uh, Vietnamese has solid Austroasiatic roots. Austroasiatic elements are seen in Vietnamese vocabulary and its linguistic system. The conservative archaic Vietic languages such as Arem and Ruk, they provide powerful evidence of this connection. This linguistic evidence can be linked to archaeohistorical studies of probable early Austroasiatic speakers. There is significant Chinese influence, but it must be reevaluated. Vietnamese linguistic typology resembles the Chinese model, but those changes took many centuries and some native elements remained into to the second millennium. That suggests significant sociolinguistic uh, status of Vietic in Northern Vietnam. Uh, finally, uh, I suggest collaboration. I assert that loanword data like this and these linguistic changes could be valuable to ethnohistorians and archaeologists in Vietnam and could affect hypotheses of prehistoric and early historic periods. Uh, and I hope this uh, linguistic data can be utilized by researchers in the region. And I'm trying, I'm sharing my ideas, I'm communicating with other people in the field in outside of linguistics and trying to uh, uh, encourage attention to this kind of data. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask.